Hello there, Sharks. I'm Jonathan Little for PokerCoaching.com. You all know me by now. Today is the $300,000 buy-in. Super high roller bowl. It's the biggest tournament of my life. I'm well studied, rested, prepared, and ready to do my best. I've been watching a lot of footage on the opponents. We have a big database of things they do right and wrong, et cetera, et cetera. I'll get to the table, consult the notes, and then play my best. I've been in Vegas for about two weeks. I played a bunch of Poker Masters tournaments, $10,000 to $100,000 buy-ins, and I lost all of them. I think I'm 0 for 8 or 0 for 9, something like that. But I had two big bubbles that I lost. I had pocket aces against pocket queens, all in, in the $25,000 tournament. Bubbled, got a queen on the river. In a $10,000 tournament, I had kings all in against Jack 10 suited on the bubble. He made a straight or a flush or something, I don't know, I lost. That was for a lot of chips, too. So, it's been a rough trip. That said, I feel like happy enough with the way things have gone in terms of equity. <laughs> Not so well in terms of results, but that is okay. Sometimes you're gonna have variants. You have to make sure you stay sane, stay well rested, and do your best. So anyway, $300,000 buy-in, super high roller bowl. You don't get many opportunities like this, so let's make the most of it. Most importantly for you though, we are giving away three $1,000 pieces to this tournament. 0.3333% each. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it's $1,000 each. You all enter the giveaway. The winners, are you ready for the drum roll? The winners are Chris Moody, Brian Cooper, and Glenn Bagshaw. Congrats to them for winning $1,000 each of me in the Super High Roller Bowl. Starts in about 20 minutes. I'm well rested, refreshed, ready to play. All I have to do now is run a little bit hot. First two levels have not been great. Not had very many good hands, and those that I have had have lost. Had ace-king, lose to king, 10 in a three-bet pot. That didn't work. Didn't lose that much, though. I had um, ace-eight on king, eight, two, king, six. Lost to pocket sixes. Put no money in on the river. That was good. Well, not good that I lost, but, you know, good not losing much money. I had tens in a tough spot in a three-bet pot. I came queen, eight, something, I don't remember, queen eight three, I check called, turn was a blank, I check called, like a two, river was a nine, I folded to the, on the river, to David Peters, who, know if it, who knows if it was a good fold or not, kind of a weird spot, I had the ten of spades blocking the flush draws, but I also blocked the weird jack ten that came in, he probably doesn't have too many jack tens though, <laughs> nothing's gone well, I have gotten a lot of my bluffs through, that's been pretty good, it's the only reason I have any chips, it's funny, it feels like it's gone horribly, but really I'm only down like 100 big blinds, right? 100 big blinds is uh, not a lot, not, not a good thing to be down over the course of an hour, or two hours, or three hours, whatever it's been. But at the same time, there's some variance in poker. I don't know if you were aware of that. Anyway, I have 75 big blinds when we return. We'll see how it goes. Here's a hand from early in the Super High Roller Bowl, $300,000 buy-in. We're playing about 300 big blinds deep, 500, 1,000. First level of the tournament. Folds around to me. I have ace-king offsuit. In the small blind, I raise it up to four big blinds, which I think is pretty fine and standard. We could limp if we wanted to get tricky, but I think you just want to raise all your best hands. 
My opponent in the big blind is Chris Brewer, one of the absolute best GTO players in the world. He is a crusher. Only $3 million in tournament earnings, but he's been playing the biggest games online for a while. He three bets me. Okay. 300 big blinds deep. Do we just pop it in there? Do we play for all of our money? What do you think? Take a second. Think about it. Pause the video. Write what you would do in the comments section below in this spot. We're obviously not folding. Do we call or do we bump it up? And if we bump it up, how much do we bump it up to? Do we make it 30, 50, or all in? So here's the closest chart I could find quickly on PokerCoaching.com. This is a cash game chart, so not quite the same. And it's 200 big blinds deep, so also not quite the same. But you see, Ace-King Offsuit does just want to four bet all in in this scenario. To be clear, this is 200 big blinds deep with no ante. Small blind versus big blind, three bet. So we should probably put in the four bet here to something like 50,000. That's going to put him in a pretty nasty spot. If he rips it in, what do we do? Ugh, what do we do against a five bet? Well, we pile it in there is what we're supposed to do. You ready to play for all the money in the first level of the tournament? I decided I wasn't. This is maybe a little bit chicken. I'm kind of embarrassed to even show you this hand. I feel the embarrassment emoticons raining down on my head right now. Ugh, embarrassing. All right, I call. Which I think is actually at least fine and defensible. Like we saw his queen was a call, right? Should have four bet, but we called. Flop comes. Jack 10 8, not great. I check. He bets tiny. I think the only option here is to call. We could have the best hand. We have lots of equity. We don't want to check raise and then get re raise. That would be awful. So we'll call. Try to get there. Turns a four. Check. If he bets small again, we'll probably call again. If he bets big, we'll probably just get out of the way. Check, check though. All right. Rivers of five. Should we bluff? Do we have any better bluffs? I'm not sure, actually. If you think about the worst hands in my range here, it's probably going to be something like king-queen, ace-queen, ace-nine suited. Those all would probably make a little bit better bluffs than this ace-king. I don't know. This might actually be a bluff. Maybe I have, like, ace-x of diamonds that could bluff. What it amounts to is if you can find better hands to bluff with, then you should probably not bluff with the ace-king. But if you don't have better bluffs to bluff with, then maybe this is an okay hand. What are we trying to get him to fold? We're trying to get him to fold out something like a 10 or an 8 or an under pair. He could very easily fold out a 10 or an 8 or an under pair if I blast it here for like 35k or 40k. That could be pretty sweet. That said, he could just be randomly sitting here with a really good hand, like pocket fives, like 7-6 for all I know. Maybe he bets those on the turn, who knows. He could have easily a jack. I think a jack would, would definitely check back the flop some, or check back the turn some portion of the time. He could also easily have a 10, like ace 10, king 10, queen 10, 10, 9. All those hands would very likely check back the turn. So given he could have a lot of those hands and I don't think he's going to fold them, I just decided to check and then check fold if he bets. Check, check though. He shows me the king 10 offsuit and I wish I would have four bet preflop. Here we have the beautiful pocket 10s against David Peters, one of the absolute Best poker players in the world. $36 million in live tournament earnings. That's um, a whole lot. $36 million more than almost everyone. Folds around to someone who raises it up. I actually don't remember who this was. Who was this? I don't remember who this was. They raise it up to 4000 I opt to just call. I think 3-betting is perfectly fine, perfectly viable. We certainly could 3-bet. Perhaps this was either an like overly insane player who I thought may four bet me a lot, which I don't think is really where you want to be. It's fine, it's fine, but not really where you want to be. Or maybe I thought this player was a bit on the tight side, in which case I didn't want to three bet either. Whatever. Folds around to David Peters on the button, who makes it 17K. Initial razor folds back to me with pocket tens. We cannot fold here. Some people get really chicken and think, oh, $37 million in tournament caches. I guess I should get out of the way. But no, 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 no. David Peters knows how to bluff. This is a spot where we just have to call, see the flop, and go from there. Flop comes. Queen, eight, four, two spades. We have the ten of spades. I check. He bets 15K. Woo, it's already getting pricey. Can't fold here, though. We have backdoor draws. We could easily have the best hand. A lot of hands in this range are stuff like ace-king, ace-jack, right? These are hands that would definitely bet the flop some portion of the time. 
He could just have hand like ace five of diamonds and be taking a shot at it. Really, I'm not sure what David Peter's strategy here is in this scenario. I have to presume he's going to be a little bit on the tight and aggressive side, but for all I know, maybe this is a spot where he just squeezes and gets after a preflop and then triples it off a lot because he thinks people overfold. If that's the case, um, I better not fold. I call, turns a five of diamonds, I check, and now he bets again. All right, this is where it is very important to make sure your range is well protected. As long as you know you have sets in this scenario, like pocket eights and pocket fours, maybe even pocket fives if we decide to get a little bit splashy, and you also know that you have some other made hands you're just not folding, like ace queen and king queen, I think this is a fine spot to call the turn and then fold the river. What a lot of people do, I'm not necessarily say wrong, but makes their spot way worse in this scenario, is they check raise stuff like sets on the flop. That makes their best hand in their range now something like ace-queen, which actually could still be beat, right? And even then, a lot of people check raise ace-queen on the flop, which makes their best hand king-queen, right? And as your range gets weaker and weaker and weaker, you have to be more inclined to just call down in these spots. Otherwise, you're check folding everything. I mean, imagine the most straightforward player in the world who check raises every queen and better on the flop. Just imagine someone did that. The best hand they could have in their range on the turn is now pocket jacks besides the turned maybe 7-6 or turned pocket fives. Not very many combinations of that. If the best hand you can have in your range is pocket jacks, well now it would be criminal to check call the turn and then check fold the river. So you want to make sure you protect your check calling range with lots of other better hands like sets, ace-queen, king-queen, queen-jack that you know you're not folding if your opponent blasted on the river. You may say, you're really not folding queen-jack if he jams the river? No. <laughs> Sometimes you got to be willing to go with it. This is clearly a spot where he's setting up an all-in on the river some portion of the time. I think this is a fine spot to check call. That said, we actually don't have a great hand to check call with because if you think about the hands we want him to be bluffing with, hands that make a lot of logical sense, that would be jack-10, jack-9, and 10-9. Also, spade draws. And our 10 of spades and the two 10s block a lot of those, which makes it more likely that he has a made hand, right? So... I'm not going to say this is like a definitively easy call, but I think against a good strong opponent, this is a spot where you have to make sure your checking range is well protected and then call with this hand with a plan on folding it to a river bat. But, you know, I could be convinced from a GTO point of view, this particular hand, two tens with a 10 of spades could be a fold right here to this big bat. I call though, river's a nine. I check, he puts it in. I block jack 10. He could just be bluffing me. This is a spot where a lot of people think he just has the nuts fold, obviously. Other people think, look at all the bluffs in his range. He could have lots of ace-x of spades, maybe even king-x of spades. Sure. Some of his, uh, his obvious bluffs, though, come in with jack-10, right? I know I block him, but jack-10 comes in. He could just be value betting ace-queen, maybe even, uh, obviously, aces and kings and eight and queens. So I think this is a spot where we have to fold. Sticking with the plan, check call flop, check call turn, check fold river. What a bummer. Wish I had a queen. Or maybe I don't. Maybe, maybe I'm glad I didn't have a queen if you had the nuts. We're going to the feature table. Level three was okay. What happened? I don't know. I want some hands. We have 180k from a 300k star. We'll do our best. On the next one. I'm back in my room. I made it to day two. The problem is, is I have 56,000 chips. Not very many. Nine big blinds. Not where you want to be. Today was a tough day. I did not get very many cards. I've not watched the stream yet. I was on it for three hours. I was told I'd be happy with it. I guess that means I made quote unquote right decisions. <sighs> I didn't really make a whole lot of hands. It's tough when you don't make a whole lot of hands. It's frustrating you don't make a whole lot of hands, but then you have to realize it's one tournament. Sometimes you're not going to make a lot of hands. I was talking to one of my friends, Jonathan Jaffe. He says he doesn't like tournaments where he just doesn't really get off the ground. And I completely agree. I have not gotten off the ground in today's tournaments. And that happens. I don't know, 30, 40, 50% of the time, probably 40% of the time, 30% of the time, somewhere in there. <sighs> I got shallow. I want to flip. I got her all in with ace four against Jack nine suited. I won. Would you believe that? So I guess I'm lucky to be in. Tough day, though. Tough day. I'm going to go to bed. Try to do better tomorrow.
spoiler alert, I lost. Quick and painless, quick and easy. Funny enough, I spent all morning studying short stack shove scenarios because I knew I was gonna go back to have eight or nine big blinds. They put me in the big blind on the first hand. Someone raises three X. I have the king three offsuit I fold. Second hand, jack nine suited, jack nine of hearts in the small blind. Under the gun, men raised. Folds around to me. Shove fold charts go out the window here because with seven big blinds, I have no fold equity. Cool spot, right? Actually six and a half, no, seven, seven big blinds. I decided to call. Why call? Because big blind's gonna call quite often. I'm gonna check the flop. Big blind's gonna check the flop. Under the gun's gonna bet. If I have anything decent, I'm putting my money in. Or I call and every once in a while, the big blind squeezes. Big blind squeezes, initial razor folds. I plot my money in there getting good pot odds. If big blind squeezes and under the gun re-raises, ooh, still probably just plot my money in there. Um, anyway, big blind squeezed. I got it all in, heads up, with um, one, two, three dead big blinds in the pot. Not so bad. I have jack nine of hearts against king nine offsuit. I lose. Now I'm gonna get a flight home. This was not a great trip. Honestly, didn't have that good of a time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Trips like these uh, make you wonder what in the world you're doing. Sometimes you're just going to run poorly. And I, I definitely ran poorly on this trip. Such is life. I'll be back for the World Series. Goodbye. What's big, green, and gives you the freedom to do whatever you want? Yeah, it's money. And if you want to start your journey to a big pile of money, click the subscribe button right over here. See you in the next video.